So I was born in prison and uh, my, gra my grandmother came and got me and brought me to Chicago. Family was very poor. Nobody graduated from high school. It seemed like everyone, only thing that we knew was the street life. Police that pulled up. They come to the cop, pull guns out, put the guns to our heads, like, get out before I blow your brains out, and this and that and that. He like, man, my little brother shot in the head. My little brother shot in the head. So they was like, no, you ain't going nowhere. So anytime you have guns, guns is kind of like, Access and you know what I'm saying. It's, you could either take somebody's life or take or somebody take your life. And he put the gun down, and I picked it up, and I shot him. Bad, bad boys, bad boys all over this church. Heroin, cocaine, all that kind of stuff. But you are reaching back into the community and saying, "Come on up in here." And then there's love, there's joy. When you see other men of God, it, it makes it gives you the, the confidence to take off that mask. Because out here in the world, when you're not saved, you, you have a mask on and, and you portraying to be a gangster, a drug dealer, you portraying to be this and be that. But then when you see righteous men, you see men of God, that makes you desire to be like that. I was able to reach out to younger brothers that was going through the lifestyle that I went through. I was able to tell them that it was a better way. As I began to reach out to brothers, brothers was delivered from drugs and alcohol. Brothers was delivered from crack cocaine. Brothers put down their flags of the gang activity. Uh, men in prison today, they thank me. I tell them to thank God, you know, because God, he saved me, you know, and I know that if he saved me, he can save them. Often referred to as the birthplace of rock and roll, home of the blues and city of churches, Memphis, Tennessee is world renowned for its rich musical history that includes Stax Records, High Records, Sun Records, and Beale Street. Memphis is also the place where Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, where over 600,000 people each year visit Graceland, and where in 1907, Charles H. Mason founded the Church of God in Christ, the largest Pentecostal denomination in America. In 1946, Memphis was the birthplace of Eugene Spencer Johnson, the sixth of 11 children born to Rance and Loris Johnson. Many years later, 630 miles away in Madison, Wisconsin, Eugene would found and oversee a ministry that ultimately aided the transformation, redemption, and life success of thousands of African American men. Men who once led lives of drugs, gangs, poverty, incarceration, despair, and hopelessness, who are now stable fathers, husbands, community leaders, businessmen, and activists. These are men who reach out to the down trodden, disillusioned, and disenfranchised to help lift them up to become productive, impacting members of society. These are the stories and testimonies of six such men, men who were once as bent nails, discarded and deemed useless, who are now deeply committed to being instruments of change and restoration for a hurting world. Bent nails is a metaphor for life, of life. And how I came across Ben Nails is one morning when I woke up, it seemed like the Lord just uh, put on my heart. And all the people that I, we're dealing with at Madison Pentecostal Assembly are like Ben Nails. And they remind me of uh, the nails that I dealt with when I was growing up uh, as a child in Memphis, Tennessee poor and we had to make our own toys sometimes build little tree houses things what we call skate trucks nail boards together and put a pair of skates under them and uh, to get nails we would go to construction sites where they were building homes and um, look for nails that had been cast off by the carpenter or nails that were struck and that flew away uh, when they would hammer them um, and so we would find these nails close to the house where they were building. Some of the nails were, uh, had been there a while. They were uh, potentially rusty 
or rustine, I should say. And so I would gather those nails up, all of them that I could find, put them in my pocket and go home and uh, attempt to straighten them out so that I could use them. While taking these nails home, they would really scratch the, uh, my leg because they were in my pocket and that created a lot of pain. But the most of the pain in straightening out these nails came from when I would put them on the step and try to straighten them out with a crude hammer. Which at that time, most of the time, it was a rock or a brick that I would use to hammer the nails in place. You know, I thank God for the deliverance. Um, even, even uh, you know, I got born again in prison. And see, and, and the Lord has spoke to me and told me to let my gang members know that I'm no longer part of them and, 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 and to lay my flag down. I went and told them, brothers, I no longer follow you, but I follow Christ Jesus. Amen. I was born in Chicago, Illinois, on the west side. It was even in, in grammar school. I remember... Um, me and my little buddies will be going and, as we call it, hitting stains, hitting, hitting licks at a, at a young age and coming to school with big knots of money in our pockets. And so I got to hanging out with, with my homeboys and they was involved in gangs. And that's when uh, the, the gang life started for me. And I started hanging out with a certain gang. Um, in K-Town is another part of the west side of Chicago. And that's when I really got to getting involved in, in the really game banging and going out there hard, selling drugs, standing on the block, um, selling jabs as we called it, you know, um, smoking and drinking and hanging out. I was uh, about 13 to 14 years old when I first got introduced to the, the game banging and being involved in gangs. I know this guy from before I came to the church. He met me on the block. We, we kind of got on the block together. Chicago? No, here in Madison. I was born um, in the city of Chicago, August of 1964. My mom got sick and um, mom passed away. At that time, my father was in a situation where he wasn't able to provide for me and my brother and sister. And my grandmother ended up taking custody of us after my mom passed away. And from at that point, we transitioned from the city of Chicago to Los Angeles, California. Where well, I was born in New York prison. Uh, my mom and my dad, they were, uh, they were in the criminal life. And uh, they was hustlers. And my mom, she was a heroin addict. And so uh, she was pregnant with me and they both, mom and dad, both went to prison in 1965 when she was pregnant with me. And while she was having me, she had complications and she passed away. So I was born in prison and uh, my, gra my grandmother came and got me and brought me to Chicago where I grew up on the south side of Chicago. I later on went on to junior high school, and when I got into junior high school, I started attending Horseman Junior High School. Lots of gang activities. Uh, my grandmother took me out of Horseman because um, I started getting affiliated with a lot of bloods and um, a lot of guys that I started going to horse, uh, Horseman with were a Trey Crips, and then they wanted to retaliate towards me. Um, I guess I was guilty uh, by association. I, I was raised in Warren, Arkansas. I went to school in Warren, Arkansas. Um, and uh, my parents separated when at a very young age. I was about five years old when they separated. I grew up in Arkansas, uh, southern a country boy, what people call me. <laughs> uh, raised up by a single mom, you know, had four brothers and four sisters. Yeah, we have four different fathers uh, of the uh, of the nine kids, so it, I really didn't really have any male figures around that can you know guide me and uh, teach me different things. In elementary school to middle school, I walked about eight miles to school every day uh, while during the school uh, season, and then also in high school, I walked about ten miles. 
uh, from high school uh, to home every day. During the walk in the school, <laughs> pretty much we got in fights all the time, uh, you know, because there was a group of kids always walking to school. Somebody was always picking on somebody. And we pretty much uh, got on a lot of fights. There was no stabbing and shooting and stuff that nature because we pretty much used our dukes and our hands to fight. Around 14 years old, uh, you know, I just was tired of being, you know, broke and, and we raised up by a single mom, so we was always poor. So, you know, for me, I was looking at other people, you know, and and it became, you know, appealing. And so, uh, so at age 14, 15, dealing drugs and then got involved in guns, uh, weapons, making, thought of making money and making money. And I was my own guy. And they, by age 16, you know, uh, I kind of like running things and having, you know, uh, money and lots of it. So anytime you have guns, guns is kind of like access. And you know what I'm saying? It's, you could either take somebody's life or take or somebody take your life. And, and everybody wanted to be who you were, every, and then, you know, you, you have, and I'm riding around with truckloads of, of money in my car, and I was always afraid that, you know, somebody's going to hit me, uh, hit me up, or, uh, you know, kill me, because if they rob you, they're going to kill you, because they don't want no, you know, witness, that's just the way the streets work. Um, so with that said, it's kind of like every time I went home, I had to go a different route. I had to stay in different spots because it was just, it wasn't safe for me to, you know, uh, I felt that it wasn't safe for me to go home. And I was drinking, you know, all the way through high school. And um, so, and after I finished high school, I went to California. I left and went to California. And that's where I got introduced to all the drugs, uh, pretty much the cocaine, uh, the whites, the reds, uh, the hashy, and all the, you know, pretty major drugs. That's why I got introduced to them. We want those who have been rejected by society. We want others who have not been rejected, but we want those who have been rejected. We, we care about them, and we want to see uh, people do better. And so um, uh, there are a lot of bent nails who have been cast off, put out, rejected, and so forth by society. He was in Memphis, a student at Lemoyne Owens College. In 1968, during the sanitation workers' strike and the assassination of Dr. King, he attended UCLA. During student unrest, the tenure of Angela Davis, and the brilliance of John Wooden and the NCAA basketball champion Bruins. He married the former Carolyn Smith in 1971 and credits her for teaching him that he could challenge the system. Carolyn was born and raised in a middle-class family up north, but attended Fisk University near Nashville in the 1960s. He was an active participant in lunch counter sit-ins, marches, and protests during the civil rights movement. Fisk University students were in the second wave of Freedom Riders. When we would have the group prayer, I, I, you could just hear him crying out, Lord, send men for our sisters. And after a while, the men started coming. And when they came, I, they were just attracted, not only by what the Lord was doing in their lives, but the fact that they felt empowered and they felt that there was work for them to do. And they um, became very active and they were the main recruiters for other men. And the Lord may use, be using us as a savior and as a rescuer yeah. to go there to help. We don't know who we will encounter, but we just believe in the whole uh, uh, way that things are set up is that heaven knows and that we're going to help bring these brothers back into the kingdom. Amen. The project that we're working on is basically a fellowship with the men from Bishop Rogers Church who himself um, suffered some health issues and had a decline in his membership. One of the things that we know that helps us and that they need certainly is to reach out to men men who are experiencing tremendous hardships, and sometimes I call it men who've been run over by dope trucks, men who've been run over by bill trucks, men who've been run over by, by the paddy wagon. There was those that are involved in crime, 
men who have been run over basically by life and basically have given up. And those tend to be people who are um, most likely to respond to a call for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I would say about 80% of the men that are going with us uh, are men who themselves had to be pulled out of the fire, uh, the fire of uh, drugs and alcohol, gang bangers, prison, and poverty and joblessness and hopelessness. Uh, but now their lives uh, are being and have been put back together uh, through long-term involvement in the church. And so they have a lot to share, personal experience. They have a lot of their own experience and testimony to share, as well as uh, them just being used by Christ. Uh, it's part of their own ministry and healing and growth and development process as well. We will be there in a minute. You got to okay. show that you're listening uh, to, to them. So, okay. but I think he has enough space on his sidewalk or his driveway area to give us landing space. good day today today you know it's so important for men to come together in unity you know uh, lives are changed in the home because of men lives are changed out here because somebody took the initiative to tell their son or their daughter or their, or their family about Jesus you know men we really play a valuable role into what success is in life as far as coming up in Christ Jesus you know coming down here was a beautiful thing coming down here was beautiful to get out here to see men interact with one another, to just be able to be together with our brother. The prison ministry, we go up into the prisons and there's men everywhere. So I enjoy witnessing to the men and that men may be saved and people may be saved before they go into the prison. So we will not have to go into the prison ministry to minister to them in the prison. We can minister to them right out here in the community. And that's what I love about doing it before people commit themselves and commit a crime or doing stuff that will send them into the prisons, into the jails. But we, amen, want to keep them out and bring them into the church that they may be saved. I was raised on in this neighborhood that was called the Killer Ward, located on 79th and Ashland in Chicago. And it is rated number three of the worst neighborhoods to live in. Growing up, you didn't see too many men around. My father wasn't there. The only thing we seen was the people on the street, the drug dealers, the game bangers. And that's all we knew. I can remember growing up and I um, dropped out of school at the age of 14 years of age and living the street life, running around, trying to make money, trying to fit in and trying to be a part of what I thought was cool. Now we on the block, we over on 61st and Prairie. I'll never forget it. This was the day that like I could have been dead and gone. And uh, we was on 61st of Prairie, and there was a war at the time. 
We sitting on this on this car. It was a Cadillac. I never forget it, a big Cadillac. And we it was a Cadillac park right here on this corner. Had to be like an '86 or something. We sitting on the Cadillac. And a car pulled up from the other side of the corner. So everybody like heads up on that car, heads up on that car. So as soon as we look across the street and we see the car coming, only thing I remember is saying fire. Fire, 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 fire. They like they, they never stopped shooting, man. I don't know what the guys were shooting, but they were shooting some big artillery out there. So I as instantly everybody jumped down on the ground. So everybody trying to get up under this Cadillac, you know, as a shield from the bullets. So them bullets was just ricocheting everywhere. Everybody scrambling, trying to get away. So I ended up feeling my head and blood was running down my head. The stream of blood was running down my head and I felt it. And um, I was like, I'm hit, I'm hit. So my guy was like, where, where, where you hit at? I'm like, man, they, I'm hit in the head. And so he get to losing it. Like, man, my little brother shot in the head. Ooh, he, he like spazzing out. So he trying to keep me calm because I ain't trying to like panic or nothing like that from having a head wound. We run to the car, get in the car because he for the drive me to the hospital because the ambulance and none of that ain't even showed up yet. And when the police came, I was sitting on this curb right here. So by the time we for to get ready to pull off, police that pulled up. They come to the cop, pull guns out, put the guns to our heads, like, get out before I blow your brains out, and this and that and that. He like, man, my little brother shot in the head. My little brother shot in the head. So they was like, no, you ain't going nowhere. So they made us get out the cop. So they got us sitting on the curb, and I'm still just sitting there leaking. And uh, they waited till the ambulance coming, whatever. You know, I get in the ambulance. They take me to Cook County Hospital to the emergency room. So when I get to the emergency room and the doctor seen that I had a headshot wound, they just was like, don't nobody come in here with no headshot wound such as what you have and live to be talking about it. And by the time I got to like about 10 years old, I began to get high. I began to experiment with drugs and alcohol. And um, the following year, by the time I was 11, I got recruited uh, in, in the gangs. So they were, the gangs was there just to, you know, uh, they they draw you in because, you know, you, you have a longing to be loved. You have a longing for family. And, and so they come in to replace your family is what they do. So as I transitioned from, from Los Angeles to the, to the south side of Chicago in 79, you know, gang, the gang activity was very high in the neighborhood. Uh, folks was uh, robbing the freight trains and um, that's around the corner from the house. You know, we became a product of that environment. So before you knew it, by the winter, of uh of 79 we were robbing the freights and um you know we became uh gang members of that community and uh you know i picked up this logo that you know i was almighty and i didn't like nobody eventually down the road by three years after i was in the city of chicago uh i was in cook county jail and so I was recruited and then I began my criminal activity, robbing and breaking into houses and stealing and doing armed robberies and jewelry stores. I was 11 years old at this time. I, I got my uh, grade school diploma. I, I graduated out of eighth grade. And so after that, I had enough of school. So I didn't, I didn't go back. So instead of going to school, I hung outside at high school, shooting dice, uh, gambling, and, and selling drugs, and getting high, and messing with the women. At the age of 14, I moved out, and uh, I began to live with, with my folks out in uh, with my gang brothers. Out on, you know, we, we stayed in abandoned houses, we slept in, in, in cars or abandoned houses, or, or wherever we could. And I could feel the weight of this void on my heart. 
And so it, it was so painful that I just wanted to die. Uh, as I continued to stay in the Cook County Jail for six to nine months, I was then transferred to a maximum security prison. And that prison was Stateville Correctional Center. Stateville has been called the world's toughest prison. Stateville Correctional Facility is home to some of Illinois' deadliest men. Nearly 60% are in for murder. Stateville was one of the wildest and most violent prisons in the country. Going up into a maximum security prison where it was just radical. You know, I had never heard so many voices at one time talking. And uh, it was kind of scary to me. I was I was 19 years old. I moved out to Joliet, Illinois, and where one of my cousins was living, and she was telling me about Wisconsin, how good it is up in Wisconsin, and uh, how how you know how much you can get on welfare out in Wisconsin, and you know how how easy it is to get over on the people in Wisconsin, and you could really do some good hustling out there. I said, sign me up. I found myself in the county jail and facing 160 years. Where I ended up getting a 20 year, a 20 year prison bit and I went to Walpon. So I'm up in Walpon and immediately I clicked in with the uh, with, with, with old gang members that I ran into. Uh, and so, we began to gang bang up in prison. Then I ended up uh, going to the hole, had an altercation with the correctional officers. So we jumped on about nine officers and they got hurt real bad. And uh, the security director said, well, we know you was involved. And so we're gonna keep you in segregation until we feel deemed that, uh, that, that you're ready for general population. So I sat in the hole, I, I sat in, on administrative seg for four years. Then I was sent to Green Bay Correction. And I had a friend, you know, and my friend that I ran with, um, calling no names, uh, you know, we was pretty close. And uh, so we got into a fight with some people and uh, apparently they broke to their car and they came out with, one came out with a shotgun and we took off running and then my friend got shot. His legs, got both his legs uh, blowed off. So basically I left there and I went, I came to uh, Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, went to pick up some uh, drugs and uh, you know, the guy, uh, uh, and this was one of the big guys, one of the big pushers. And he got like a lot of bodyguards in the room. So every, if the room is kind of always, you, you never see the big guy without, you know, weapons. So if everybody is armed, you know, I'm armed. And before I see him, they take your weapon and let you in to, you know, do your bidding. And if he feel any kind of, you know, pressure or vibe or anything that something is not right, you know, you, you, it, it possibly you die in that, in that scenario. A gun got put to my head. Uh, 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 the guy pulled the trigger. You know, uh, nothing happened. And he threw the gun down. They gave him another gun. Uh, uh, he get put the other gun to, to my head and pulled the trigger. Nothing happened. He put point the gun to the toward the wall. The gun fired. Uh, you know, uh, I, you know, I think about, you know, he said, the guy that made the, the comment, and, and trust me, this guy, that he had no relationship, no spiritual uh, lifestyle at all. It was all about streets. And he said, well, you got to call it on your life. Get out of here. I was like 18 at that time uh, when that happened. And then, you know, it just really started making me be real leery about, you know, everything that I was doing. I got in a little trouble where I where uh, one uh, was doing a lot of fighting and you know womanizing and stuff like this, and so one guy thought I was messing with his wife, so he grabbed me in the hallway and picked me up. Not a big guy, picked me up, and uh, always carried a pistol at that particular time. So I went in my back pocket, got the pistol out, and shot him off of me. And then I uh, also flee the scene and came back later on, and uh, police picked me up, and I spent some time in jail and. Uh, yeah, I got me two good lawyers and 
And after that, uh, they put me on probation for about two years. And we were playing cards, and a guy pulled a gun on me and, uh, you know, threatened me. And he put the gun down, and I picked it up, and I shot him. Uh, and uh, so after, you know, and uh, so I shot him. And, and then um, I left with this young lady, and, and then I went home. And the next morning, the police came and asked me about it, and I told them, I said, well, you know, self-defense, therefore, uh, he let me go. When I end up, when we end up did coming to Madison, I end up, you know, meeting some guys from, you know, a few areas that was in Chicago, because it seemed like at the time, everybody was moving from Chicago to Madison, because, you know, they felt like it was sweet down here. A lot of the guys was moving down here just for the hustling. You know, because they heard how sweet it was on the hustling, how you could double and triple up as opposed to living in Chicago, you weren't really doing nothing like that. So they knew how sweet it was out here. So as that in a city where whites outnumber blacks more than eleven to one, Madison made over one thousand arrests of black children between the ages of ten and seventeen in twenty thirteen. I thought I was just going to be selling drugs and game banking for the rest of my life. That's how I had it planned. I had ended up um, catching a, a slight charge up here um, and they had locked me up and put me on probation for it. And then the probation officer called me to the office one day to come in and said, Larry, they for the, uh, put you on this in this program. I'm like, what program are you talking about? She's like, yeah, we should have put you in a SIU program. It's a special investigations on the program that you're going to be involved in. Um, they, it's a selection process where they select 12 of the most worst violent criminals in Madison. Authorities laid down an ultimatum tonight to some of this area's most violent repeat criminals. Either start now to turn their lives around or plan on spending a long stretch in prison. And so, they end up selecting me. I had to go in front of this panel to where it was every law enforcement agency in uh, Wisconsin, from the IRS to the FBI to the DEA, anyone you can name, Sheriff's Department, the, the district attorney was there. So I knew at the time that they were speaking to us that these folks really were not plan. They was really gonna send us up the river if we did anything else. When we give our scholarship money, I want men, our men, to be the ones who would give the money to our young people. Honest, good money that comes from the church. I know a lot of people talk about an achievement gap and uh, as if we are comparing ourselves to the larger society. But we like to focus on the effort gap. We want to make sure that our parents are enabled to assist their children to achieve, um, to make the effort to achieve. And uh, while our parents do work several jobs and we don't have stay-at-home moms who can do the homework for the kids, as many in the middle-class society do, or to spend a lot of time with them, we are dealing with multiple fronts, you know, relatives who've gone astray, uh, housing, challenges, uh, employment situations, and yet we have to find time, some, some quiet time to sit down with our children to help them get their homework and so forth. But the, but, uh, but the greatest effort that we can put forward is number one, making sure that that student goes to school every day on time, that that student is fed and goes to school with a positive attitude so that they can get along with the teacher and with other students in the classroom and that they are thinking well, that they are functioning at their highest level. So we give them a hug and make sure that they are ready to perform. Whether they are poor or middle class or upper 
middle class in our church. The thing is, is that everybody must put forth an effort to achieve. And I believe that when that effort is there, it is consistent and sustained, that we want to make sure we recognize effort. As a church, we applaud effort uh, publicly when our students achieve, when they get notes at home, then when they talk about things that they're participating in, where they have perfect attendance and so forth. So um, I believe that the achievement gap, the quote unquote achievement gap really starts with the effort gap. So after serving three years in prison in the state of Illinois, I was released and I returned back to the same community that I came out of when I got arrested. And as I got back into the community, you know, I got back with the same guys again. Um, uh, my friends was getting killed. Uh, I would hear plots on guys wanting to kill me. And I found out that I had some family in Madison, Wisconsin. So I came down to visit them and, um, you know, Madison was something totally different to me. It was like, you know, it was like leaving the hood, going to Disneyland. And uh, so I came here and, you know, it was, the grass was green and everything was beautiful. And um, I met a woman uh, when I was here and um, me and her started uh, talking and, um, you know, she would always... Um, tell me about Jesus. And um, eventually I got into the I got into the phase of crime here in Wisconsin and I ended up back in prison again. I had not had a visit for eight years. And then finally one of the inmates uh, told me about this one guy that would come in and visit people. And so uh, he asked me if I would like to get this guy on my visiting list. So I said, why not? So I wasn't expecting this white guy to come in. And he came to visit me and uh, he would visit me like maybe twice a month. And then it started to maybe once a week. And we became real good friends. And um, all of a sudden one day he came to me and he said, uh, he said, I believe the Lord desires for me to bring your son in for to visit you. I said I had been I had been telling him about how my son was was going down the same path that I went down. My son he got kicked out of school um, and here it is he's 16 years old living on the streets selling drugs uh, had several uh, warrants out for his arrest and so my son came up to visit me for three days. Uh, I had a three-day visit. And the amazing thing is, is my son had warrants out for his arrest. But yet, he was able to come up and visit me. That's only by the power of God. So, while he was up on the visit, I told him that I believe the Lord desires for him to turn himself in not to be on the run from the law. And so uh, he agreed to it reluctantly. And so uh, after the third day visit, my friend who brought my son up, took him, took my son back to Racine, Wisconsin, where my son had three warrants out for his arrest. My son ended up getting all those charges dropped. And this guy, my friend, Jim Moore, he turns around and he tells the judge, I just left his dad in prison. And his dad has given me permission to, to raise him as a foster child. And the judge released my son into Jim's custody. And my son went on to go to high school, get his high school diploma. He went on to college and got a college degree uh, for a social worker. And right now he's a social worker. He's a family man, uh, has three children right now. So I went uh, to church uh, with, with, with my wife. And uh, so uh, I got baptized in Jesus' name. 
and that filled with the Holy Ghost. And after that, all the drinking, drugs, and everything, I had no desire, you know, to, uh, you know, drink, smoke, and all that stuff any longer. So I was healed and delivered from that. And then that's when uh, I began to work for the Lord. Um, and uh, I began to establish a prayer life, you know, and uh, reading and everything, my job, my my job and everything just changed. Uh, everything just turned around. My whole life turned around. And um, and uh, so it took a while, though, you know, for everything to start mending the way it should be. It really made me sit down and think about just life in general. Do I want to be around for my kids or do I not want to be around? Uh, you know, it's just, it's just, it was all about a choice. Uh, at age 20, I totally uh, walked away because I, I looked. I wanted to be the father for this child, and, and I know if I stayed in the game, you know, uh, 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 I probably wouldn't have survived or, or probably killed somebody. My son, uh, after he uh, became a foster child to uh, my friend Jim, uh, Jim would bring him up every week to visit me. And that had an impact on my life. I mean, so that made me want to get out and do the right thing and stay out so that I could be part of my son's life. Well, after 18 years, I was finally released from prison. And right before I left out the door, this one correctional officer told me that uh, we're going to hold the cell for you for we know you'll be back. And so we're going to keep the lights on. I told her, I said, yeah, I will be back. But when I come back, I'm going to come back with a suit on and I'm going to be coming through the front doors and I'll be leaving the same day. And I won't have handcuffs on. I'm coming back to minister to these men who I'm leaving behind. I was just staying focused, just continuously doing what I had to do, making sure I seen my PO making sure, uh, you know, I did everything right. And so, in that turn, I ended up meeting another guy that um, is the head of Vision Beyond Bars. He had heard about all the good things that I was doing and heard that I was on the right path, and he wanted somebody to help him mentor other adults who was going through the selection process. So he, like, recruited me in and asked me if I wanted to be a part of it. And I was like, yeah, I'd love to be a part of it because these guys don't know what they're getting into when they're getting into this type of situation because this is very serious. This is their life. And this is the point at the, you know, this is a time where they really need to think about turning around their life. And so I end up starting mentoring the guys with him. I start going to the SIU call-ins. So instead of me being the guy that was on the front row that was being talked to, now, I was the guy that was in up there with the law enforcement agencies in the community talking to these guys. Uh, I called the, the chaplain, and the chaplain from Green Bay Correctional, and I, and I told him, I said, well, you know, uh, I believe there's a calling on my life uh, to come back and talk to the men that's in prison. And so he told me, he said, that's going to be impossible. He said, because you have to be out for two years and you have to be off parole for nine months. So that's almost three years. And he said, uh, you just getting out. He said, they're not going to let you back in here. And so I told him, well, I said, just uh, present it to the warden and see what happens. So he told me that he would. And about three months go by and I get a call from the, from the chaplain. And he said, I don't know what happened, but... All of a sudden, the warden said, okay. So uh, from that time on, I began to go into the prisons and talk to the men and minister to them about, uh, about getting out of prison and staying out of prison, the recidivism rate. And I began to tell them uh, about how the Lord has a desire to use them, but he needs to get them out of prison and so I began to talk to them about living a new life, about living for the Lord and walking upright and walking holy. And I began to tell them, well, look at what the Lord is doing in my life. If he did it for me, he'll do it for you because God is no respecter of persons. And so uh, I ministered to the men and now I go into 
three other prisons. I go into to, uh, Green Bay Correctional, Fox Lake Correctional, Oshkosh Correctional, and the Wisconsin Resource Center. And of course, the, uh, the Dane County Jail. After that transition, uh, getting out of prison uh, and out of jail here in Wisconsin, I decided to turn my life over to Christ. I was tired of going through the ups and downs. I was tired of having the contact with police. Uh, me and my wife was married, and I just wanted to do what was right um, in God's God eyes and do what's right as a father and as a husband. I, I was called into the ministry, you know, and and me and my daughter was called into the ministry together, and we began to serve the Lord, you know, and um, the Lord was using us mighty. And, you know, I just, I, I never had in my wildest dream that I would have been a preacher through all the stuff that I went through in my life. And uh, the Lord has spared my life. He had He had kept me through the storm, you know, uh, all the, the, God, the, the things guys shooting at me, all, all my friends I lost in this game uh, out here in the streets, uh, you know, the Lord kept me, didn't allow me to get killed. Uh, Allow, he spared my life in prison, that, that I didn't get killed in prison. Uh, he began to use me in the church where I was able to reach out to younger brothers that was going through the lifestyle that I went through. I was able to tell them that it was a better way. I was able to tell them the goodness of Jesus Christ. Uh, I began to do prison ministry. Um, I began to do ministry in the county jails. Uh, uh, I go, I start going into the prisons. I begin to preach to the men and tell the men the goodness of Jesus. Tell the men that it was a better way. Telling the men they didn't have to go through what they were going through if they surrendered their life to Christ. Brothers was delivered from drugs and alcohol. Brothers was delivered from crack cocaine. Brothers put down their flags of the gang activity. When I came to Madison, uh, I, I I felt that God was leading me to this church and, and leading me to for a ch totally change. I sat back for a year, sat back and watched uh, uh, Pastor uh, uh, Nathaniel White. And, but I had to, you know, just call him and, and hey, just, uh, you know, checking check in and sit at church and watch. And, and it was all genuine. And I was like, man, this is uh, this is real. This is real. And, and um, so... I really wanted to be a part of that. Uh, I didn't want to play church. I didn't, you know, uh, I wanted to be genuine, uh, have love, you know, not only for my family, for uh, uh, single brothers, uh, single sisters, uh, families in the church. I always, always wanted to be committed to 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 these things because this is what really, really what keeps me. Just the other day I had questions of the master. Well, all the brothers in the land are national disaster. He said, what they need is a very fine pastor. Said, here, my Lord, I'm the one you're after. So listen to me, brothers all across the land. Every brother ought to be a Pentecostal man because a Pentecostal man is an apostolic man. And an apostolic man, a Pentecostal man, Pente, 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 ooh, ah, Pente, 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 ooh. Uh, you see, a Pentecostal man is going above because a Pentecostal man full of love. Pente, pente, pente. Ooh, ah. that I have, uh, my pastor always said, okay, well, you can always, you know, work with the rough ones. So, <laughs> you know, as they came in, he seemed to pass on the ones that, you know, has various issues in their lives. And they began to work with me, and they worked they work with me, and uh, they listen uh, to some of the things that we say and we, we do. Uh, many of them has uh, said, okay, that I was a good example in their life and they changed their life. They got saved, they still here in the church.
church and they have become strong men in the church. And one man, uh, once they become strong men in the church, they would draw other men. And this is why the church is growing because, you know, you got to have good, strong men to start out. sense of responsibility and um, so I want to teach them at church how to function on their jobs, how they can get along with their, uh, their fellow employees and ultimately to become leaders, to be better decision makers, better public speakers, helpers, team players as such. I want them to be better men in their families and so we assist them um, and encourage them in budgeting, encourage them in relationship with their wives. You know, basically considering your wife as primary, her happiness is his primary focus. And that to learn to appreciate his children, that uh, be that kind of role model to them as much as possible, uh, make sure that they are the more vulnerable ones in the family, and that their needs must be attended to, and that he must be present every day, overnight. Don't be this absentee dad, what we call the absentee dad syndrome. We want our men to be present uh, there for our children. All about Jesus.